Welcome to part four of the Ultimate True Crime Iceberg series. In this series, we profile a wide range of true crime cases, though most cases focus on situations where the victims paid the ultimate price. The Dnepropetrovsk Maniacs. In the summer of 2007, the city of Dnepropetrovsk, Ukraine, experienced a string of brutal incidents that shocked the local community and the world at large. Over the span of several weeks, 21 residents of the city fell victim to violent acts committed by a group of individuals who would later be known as the Maniacs. This group comprised three young men, Viktor Syenko, Igor Saprunuk, and Alexander Hanza. Their crimes seemed to lack any clear motive and targeted a broad spectrum of the community, including children, the elderly, and homeless individuals. The attackers appeared to choose their victims randomly, and the methods used were particularly savage. The maniacs predominantly used blunt objects like hammers and steel construction bars, apparently to inflict maximum cruelty. The severity of the attacks left the victims unrecognizable, and in some instances, there were signs of extreme desecration. This brutal spree of the maniacs began on the night of June 25, 2007, marking the start of a nearly month-long reign of terror. Ekaterina Ilchenko, a 33-year-old woman, was attacked while returning from a friend's place, struck unexpectedly by Saprunuk with a hammer. She was discovered by her mother early the next morning, and unfortunately, this was just the start of the horror. Within an hour, there was another discovery, Roman Tatarevich was found brutally slain. He had been sleeping on a bench which was located right across from the local prosecutor's office. The violence escalated on July 1st, with Evgenia Grishenko and Nikolai Serchuk found slain. The string of violence continued on July 6th in Nipro, located nearby. That night, Igor Nechvaloda, a young ex-soldier, was savagely attacked on his way home. Nearby, Yelena Shram, a night guard, was ambushed by Saprunuk, who concealed a hammer beneath his shirt. Later, Valentina Hanza, a mother of three, became another victim of this senseless violence. The initial break in the case came with an attack on two boys from Peterodny on July 7, 2007. One of the boys, Vadim Lyakov survived and escaped, later helping police to create sketches of the attackers. His testimony, combined with descriptions from other witnesses, aided law enforcement in connecting the dots between the separate incidents, which eventually led to the arrest of the maniacs. However, sadly, they were not brought to justice until July 23, 2007, two and a half weeks after this big break in the case. In the meantime, the maniacs claimed the lives of 13 more innocent people. The investigative effort was substantial, with more than 2,000 law enforcement officers involved from all over the country. However, the final breakthrough came when one of the suspects attempted to sell a cell phone belonging to one of the victims. The personal backgrounds of the three young men were explored during the investigation and subsequent trial. They had known each other since elementary school and shared some common, quote, interests that, disturbingly, evolved into torturing animals and, eventually, escalated to their violent spree. The evidence presented at trial included photographs and videos that portrayed their inhuman acts, further substantiating their guilt. Ultimately, the legal proceedings culminated on February 11th 2009, with Sapronuk and Sayenko receiving life sentences for their crimes. Hansa, who was found not to have participated directly in the violent acts, was sentenced to nine years for robberies that occurred prior to the crime. Unfortunately for the families of the victims, the videos of the crime scenes which came out at trial were leaked onto the internet and quickly went, quote, viral on shock websites. The only thing positive that can be said about this case 
is that the authorities seem to have acted extremely swiftly and brought down overwhelming investigative might on the maniacs. As for why they did it, well, the answer seems to be that they had a simple fascination with cruelty and senseless violence, which makes the case even more disturbing. Some individuals, like the maniacs, embody the purest form of evil and malevolence. Their actions, devoid of empathy and reason, challenge our understanding of human nature and confirm our deepest fears. These individuals inflicted pain and suffering without remorse. Further, the families of the victims have surely suffered from the loss of their loved ones for decades since, which sadly is likely considered a, quote, bonus by the maniacs. Their existence is a grim reminder that evil isn't just a concept, but can manifest in the real world, leading to acts that defy logic. On the other hand, the existence of such completely evil individuals does serve to remind us that the vast majority of people are fundamentally good and are disgusted by such acts. Anyway, there's a huge body of sources available on this case in both the Ukrainian and Russian languages, and unfortunately Google Translate isn't the best at these languages. I would like to do a long-form video on this case, but I would also like the opportunity to speak with someone who is familiar with one or both of these languages prior to doing so. Anyway, if this is you and you're interested in helping out, please join up in the Discord. The link is in the description of this video. The Slaying of Carrie Lynn Nixon In 1987, the community of Ausable Forks, New York, was shaken by the sudden disappearance of 16-year-old Carrie Lynn Nixon. The sequence of events began on the night of June 22nd, when Carrie left her home around 9.30 p.m. to pick up groceries for her father. After making her purchases, she was observed by a neighbor close to her home around 10.05 p.m. However, within mere moments, as a group of teenagers passed by, Carrie seemed to vanish without a trace. The mysterious nature of Carrie's disappearance led to various theories and significant media attention. A bizarre twist occurred when Carrie's parents, in their relentless search for their daughter, thought they spotted her in the audience of a new Kids on the Block concert in Los Angeles. The band members, Jordan and Jonathan Knight, were moved by the family's story and made public appeals for Carrie to return home. The girl in the concert footage ultimately came forward, proving she was not the missing teen, further deepening the mystery surrounding Carrie's fate. For years, Carrie Lynn Nixon's whereabouts remained unknown, leading to speculation and countless investigations. The case saw unexpected developments when, in 1994, Robert Anthony Jones confessed to the crime as part of a plea agreement. Jones revealed he had noticed Carrie at the grocery store, followed her, and subsequently abducted her at gunpoint. He then transported her to a remote area where he committed heinous acts before ending her life. Following his confession, authorities were able to locate Carrie's remains in a shallow grave near her home, bringing this tragic case to its end. Robert Anthony Jones received a life sentence for his heinous act. However, unfortunately, he does have the possibility of being paroled. There's a popular Facebook group dedicated to the denial of his parole called Keep Carrie Nixon's Killer in Prison. So if you're on Facebook and agree that Jones shouldn't be released, you may want to consider joining this group. The Slaying of Inajiro Asanuma on October 12, 1960, Japan witnessed a shocking event that would be remembered for decades. The assassination of Inajiro Asanuma, the chairman of the Japan Socialist Party. Adding to the shock, the slaying took place during a live televised debate at Hibiya Public Hall in Tokyo. This event, perpetrated by 17-year-old Otoya Yamaguchi, a right-wing ultranationalist, highlighted the intense ideological divisions within the country during the Cold War era. Inajiro Asanuma was a controversial figure 
Known for his outspoken support of socialism and his opposition to Japan's security treaty with the United States, he advocated for closer ties with the People's Republic of China during a visit to Beijing in 1959. Asanuma's radical stance made him a target for right-wing groups who viewed his policies as a threat to the traditional Japanese way of life and the imperial system. Yamaguchi, who belonged to a right-wing nationalist group, saw Asanuma's actions and statements as unforgivable betrayals of Japan's national interests. On the day of the assassination, Yamaguchi infiltrated a large crowd at the debate, armed with a wakizashi, a form of Japanese short sword often mistaken for a katana. His attack on Asanuma was swift and fatal, striking him in the left side and causing internal bleeding that led to Asanuma's death within minutes. The slaying was not only a tragic moment, but also a spectacle that was broadcast to millions, leaving an indelible mark on the national consciousness. The aftermath of Asanuma's assassination was tumultuous. The incident sparked massive protests, with thousands taking to the streets to demand accountability and express their outrage. The political crisis threatened to destabilize the government, prompting then Prime Minister Ikeda to deliver a glowing memorial speech despite political differences. Despite this, Yamaguchi's act was not without its supporters. He became a martyr to some right-wing groups who viewed his actions as a heroic defense of traditional Japanese values. Yamaguchi's imprisonment and subsequent self-ending three weeks after the slaying added another layer of complexity to the tragedy. His final note, written with toothpaste on his cell wall, expressed a fanatical devotion to the emperor and a willingness to sacrifice his life for his country. There's significant speculation that Yamaguchi didn't act alone and that he may have been part of a broader ultra-nationalist conspiracy theory. Yamaguchi vehemently denied acting in concert with a group. However, the truth of the matter died with him. I suspect that ultra-nationalist groups were heavily infiltrated by law enforcement officers during the time period in question. If Yamaguchi was acting in concert as part of a larger conspiracy, I suspect the conspirators would have been at best a small group. Further, while the Japanese socialist movement withered following this slaying, I would imagine that more senior ultra-nationalists were acutely aware of the risk of the opposite. This slaying could have very easily bolstered the resolve of the socialist movement in Japan. That said, a 17-year-old hyped up on nationalist fervor was unlikely to consider this. As such, I'm of the opinion that Yamaguchi most likely did act alone, unless the alternative theory discussed below is true. There's another theory floating around that the entire thing was orchestrated by a foreign three-letter intelligence service that was concerned about Asanuma's pro-China stance. The slaying of Lucy Blackman. In July 2000, 21-year-old Lucy Blackman, a British national with a deep appreciation for Japanese culture, moved to Tokyo in search of adventure. Lucy, a former flight attendant, took up employment as a hostess in Roppongi, Tokyo's party district. Hostessing in Japan often entails socializing with patrons to promote higher spending within clubs, yet it harbors risks due to the potential for unsolicited advances outside work premises. Women who work in this environment often supplement their income with paid companionship work after hours, if you catch my drift. However, there is no conclusive evidence to indicate that Lucy was engaging in this kind of work and even if she was, this is obviously absolutely no justification for what happened to her. Lucy's disappearance on July 1st, 2000 led to widespread concern. Her father, Tim Blackman, promptly arrived in Tokyo to seek answers and escalate the search, leveraging media attention to pressure local authorities. And seriously, I have to give Tim Blackman a massive shout out right now because without his advocacy on behalf of his daughter, nothing would have been done at all. Despite the Tokyo Metropolitan Police Department's slow start, this spotlight intensified the investigation. 
Notably, the Japanese authorities faced intense criticism for their failure to take Lucy's case seriously prior to media attention. Some have speculated that the police in general don't take crimes against foreigners working in the kind of business Lucy was involved in seriously. This, of course, has the effect of making these women prime targets for predators. The prime suspect quickly emerged, a man named Joji Obara, who was born Kim Sung Jong. Obara has an interesting history. He was born in Japan to ethnic Korean parents and amassed an extremely immense fortune during the 1980s Japanese bubble economy. However, as anyone familiar with Japanese economic history will know, the bubble economy burst at the start of the 90s, and Obara lost the vast majority of his wealth. Obara had been reported to the police on numerous occasions in the past for his clearly criminal actions against women. Prior police complaints against him had been overlooked, despite his lengthy history of conducting indecent assaults on women. The revelation of his crimes only surfaced following Lucy's disappearance, when authorities uncovered over 400 video recordings of his indecent attacks, which he filmed in his condo. As you'll see later in this section, sometimes we have to count our blessings that criminals can be extremely stupid. Obara would lure women back to his condominium, and then when they were there, he would give them a drink laced with sedatives. Also, as an aside, Joji Obara will be featured on an upcoming episode of this series, since the horrors of his crimes are, for lack of a better term, an entire rabbit hole. Despite initial setbacks, the case against Obara progressed. He was arrested following the link between his contact with Lucy and corroborative testimonies from other victims. However, his trial was marked by challenges notably the acquittal on charges directly associated with Lucy's fate due to insufficient direct evidence. Despite being legally not guilty of the actions, a friend of Obara paid 450,000 pounds to Lucy's father on behalf of Obara, because that's what innocent people do, right? But yes, I'm required to say this here. The allegations against Obara with respect to Lucy Blackman were not proven, and he is legally speaking not guilty. I will strongly encourage you to draw your own conclusions from the facts as presented and the facts of the case generally. And remember when I said we should be thankful that Obara recorded the commission of many of his crimes? Well, he wasn't able to escape the law. Obara faced justice and was convicted of multiple SA incidents and the manslaughter of another victim, Carrot Ridgeway. He spent years appealing these decisions However, in 2012, his appeals were rejected by the Japanese Supreme Court. Obara is now in prison for life and will be unable to victimize any women further. The Lucy Blackman Trust was established in the wake of this tragedy, focusing on advocating for young women who have gone missing abroad. Jimmy here, the YouTuber behind the Lazy Chill Zone channel. If you're enjoying my content, please do me a favor and hit the like and subscribe buttons and slap that sweet notification bell. Also, consider signing up for a YouTube membership or the Patreon and joining the Discord community. The YouTube and Patreon memberships allow me to engage in less self-censorship. After all, your support can free me from concerns about demonetization. And trust me, when you hit on the sort of topics I hit on demonetization is always a very real concern. Also, the Discord community is super active now, so if you've been on the fence about joining up, now's the time. The Frankfurt Slasher The Frankfurt Slasher's case, running from 1985 to 1990 in the Frankfurt neighborhood of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, remains a largely unsolved serial slaying. This period saw the tragic end of eight to nine individuals, all of whom suffered a violent demise. Leonard Christopher, who was convicted for one of these crimes, has been a central figure in discussions, though he's been dubbed a copycat killer by police. The victims shared certain characteristics. They were women living on the societal margins, 
many with backgrounds of mental health issues or substance dependency. The investigation revealed a pattern of assault and a methodical manner in which the victims were left. Most of the victims frequented Goldie's Bar, a local establishment, which emerged as a critical link in understanding the perpetrator's hunting ground. This bar was a noted hangout for women who engaged in the practice of paid companionship, so the full nature of the connection to the bar is unknown. Police efforts to solve the case were marred by controversy and criticism, with some accusing the police of attempting to sweep the slayings under the rug. Early on, there was hesitation in linking the crimes, and when connections were finally acknowledged, the focus on Leonard Christopher drew scrutiny. The reason for this scrutiny was simple. Christopher was black, and all evidence pointed toward the Slayer being a white middle-aged male. Despite the conviction of Christopher for one slaying, it is now widely believed that the real perpetrator remained at large. Given the socioeconomic status of the victims and the lack of attention on this case, Unfortunately, I have my doubts as to whether this will ever be solved. Unfortunately, this is the reason serial slayers seem to target women at the bottom of this industry. These predators know that many people engaging in paid companionship on the street level will have no one to advocate for them when they're gone. Further, they know that the police will, with a great degree of certainty, not allocate appropriate resources to the case. As an aside, it's unclear to me if there are any ongoing investigations into these slayings at present. The Slaying of Tomoko Takakawa On the morning of March 10, 1959, an office worker found the body of a woman floating near the Miyashita Bridge over the Zenpakuji River in Tokyo's Suginami Ward. Dressed in a green suit, silk blouse, and white undergarments, her belongings were scattered nearby. Initially suspected of drowning due to the absence of visible injuries in her missing shoes, an autopsy later indicated she might have been strangled, evidenced by marks on her neck. Fluids from two individuals were also detected, prompting a deeper investigation into her acquaintances. The deceased was identified as Tomoko Takakawa, a 27-year-old flight attendant from Ashia City, Hyogo Prefecture. Tomoko was raised Catholic and she moved to Tokyo for nursing school before working as a nurse in Ashia and then returning to Tokyo. She transitioned careers to become a flight attendant for the British Overseas Airway Corporation, thanks to her uncle's influence in the company. Takakawa was selected from among 300 applicants and was set to commence her first flight on March 13, 1959 but she disappeared after attending a birthday party on March 8th. Belgian-born Louis Charles Vermeersch, a Catholic priest, emerged as a suspect after Takekawa's notebook entries and a parcel linked him to her. Despite undergoing questioning and displaying signs of physical stress, Vermeersch denied any romantic involvement with Takekawa, stating their meeting was purely for consultation. However, Police found evidence suggesting a prior relationship. Witnesses reported sightings of Vermeersch around the time of Takakawa's disappearance. Vermeersch's alibis, which were provided by church members, were met with skepticism, which may reflect a tendency towards Japanese society viewing Christians as outsiders. Just days before a scheduled police interview, Vermeersch left Japan on an Air France flight claiming church orders and a desire to visit his aging parents. His departure left many questions unanswered, and despite never being formally charged, the cloud of suspicion never fully lifted. And as you may have been able to guess, Vermeersch never returned to Japan in any capacity. Vermeersch lived out his life in Canada, passing away in 2017 without making public comments on the case. Tomoko Takakawa's murder remains unsolved, officially closed by the police in 1974. It's unclear to me if the DNA evidence in this case was kept. However, given that the case was closed, I suspect that it may not have been. 
given the evidence in this case, I think we can say a few things for certain. First, Vermeersh was almost certainly engaging in an affair with one of his parishioners, which for a number of reasons could have landed him in ecclesiastical hot water. Second, two sources of DNA were located at the crime scene. It's possible that Vermeersh may have had a rendezvous with Tomoko, after which an unknown party ended her. In terms of Vermeersh leaving Japan, I note that the Japanese police aren't exactly known for their fair treatment of accused individuals. Bible John. Bible John, a name that still strikes fear into the heart of Glasgow, Scotland, refers to an unidentified serial slayer linked to the deaths of three women in the late 1960s. The moniker originates from the killer's alleged quoting of the Bible during his encounters with victims, leading to a media frenzy and a manhunt. The only link between the slayings was a nightclub called the Barrowland Ballroom, and the description of a well-spoken, smartly-dressed man given by witnesses. Patricia Docker, a 25-year-old nursing auxiliary, was the first victim, last seen alive on February 23, 1968. Her body was discovered the following morning, not far from her home, hidden from view. She had met her end by way of strangling. The second victim, Jemima McDonald, a 32-year-old mother of three, met a similar fate after a night at the Barrowland on August 16, 1969. Her disappearance sparked rumors among the local community, leading to the grim discovery of her body in an abandoned building. Like Patricia, Jemima had been strangled. The final known victim, Helen Putock, also 29, attended the Barrowland Ballroom on October 31, 1969. Helen's body was found the next day in the backyard of her apartment. The witness account from her sister, who had shared a taxi with Helen and the mysterious man, provided the most detailed description of the suspect, who would come to be known as Bible John. Over the years, several suspects have been considered, with one of the most notable being Peter Tobin. Tobin, a convicted serial killer, came into focus due to similarities between his known crimes and the Bible John slayings. Further, he allegedly had a presence in Glasgow at the time of the killings and does bear a resemblance to the composite sketches of the suspect. However, conclusive evidence linking Tobin to the Bible John slayings has never been found and may never be due to improper storage of DNA evidence from the slayings. Further, the police no longer consider him a suspect and have since come to have doubts that he actually lived in Glasgow at the time of the slayings. This is largely due to evidence of Tobin's wife, who has cooperated with police in relation to Tobin's crimes and denied his presence there at the time. Numerous other suspects have been considered, but all major candidates for Bible John have been cleared by the authorities. William Unick William Unek was a figure whose life took a dark turn, culminating in two separate tragic events that shook the communities he targeted. Born around 1929, Unek was a police constable prior to turning to evil. In 1954, in the Belgian Congo, Unek was responsible for the loss of 21 lives in a horrific spree. The details of this event are scant, but it was reported that he used an axe chopping at his victims indiscriminately. The reasons behind this act remain unclear, with no motive fully ascertained. After this spree, Unek fled, eventually making his way to Tanganyika, modern Tanzania, blending into a new environment under a false identity. Three years later, in early 1957, Unek initiated another spree in the area of Malampaka, using a stolen police rifle, among other weapons. This time, his actions resulted in the deaths of 36 individuals, including men, women, and children. The brutality of these acts was unimaginable, with Unek employing a range of methods to carry out his attacks, including shooting, stabbing, burning, and strangling. 
Among the victims was reportedly his own wife, whom he killed before setting their home on fire. The aftermath of the second spree led to Tanganyika's largest manhunt at the time, involving local tribesmen, police, and the king's African rifles. Despite the use of dogs and aircraft in the search, Unek evaded capture for nine days. He was eventually located due to the bravery of a local resident. Unek showed up at the home of Iyumbu Benikumbu, who distracted Unek with food, drink, and conversation while his wife was sent to notify the police. Upon their arrival, a shootout ensued, and Unek was mortally wounded. Personally, I question whether anyone involved felt too much incentive to take this guy alive. Yumbu Ben Ikumbu, recognized for his bravery, received a large financial reward and received the British Empire Medal for meritorious service in light of his actions. The cause of William Unick's two sprees is entirely unknown, and unfortunately the case is poorly documented. Further, it's unclear how many victims Unick may have had in total, given the three years between his two rampages. I suspect that there were additional victims in the interim, but again, I simply don't have access to the necessary records. Make sure to like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell. Also, check out the Patreon and the YouTube membership. Your support allows me to take on more difficult topics that risk demonetization. Shout out to my patrons, Noah Schubert, Kazak Cutie, Kurt the Squirt, Monoxide Wendigo, Jeffer Metcalf, Z Volts, Director Delta, and Unknown Delusions. Also, big shout out to YouTube members Jordan All and Syntax Nexus. Also to every viewer and listener, I love you a ton and you make this all possible. I'm not exaggerating when I say that without you this channel wouldn't exist. And don't forget to join the Discord channel to chat and interact with myself and other members of the community in real time. Click the link in the description. Until next time, stay safe and healthy. Peace out, everyone.